email. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so just to give you a background on how this webinar came about, I've been doing Medicaid and CHIP eligibility and enrollment training in a few places across the state um, since I joined the center back in January of, um, of 2015. And, but we've always had a little struggle. Texas, as, as all of you know, is very large. So we've always had a little struggle making sure that this um, got into uh, as many places, as many regions around the state of Texas as possible. So um, with a lot of requests coming from the Panhandle and the Rio Grande Valley, we decided um, it may be time to try to do a webinar so that we can reach more people. Um, so I'm going to go sort of show you what our agenda for part one is today. Um, part one of the eligibility uh, and enrollment series will focus on the eligibility process. So this is what happens when you submit an application, how does that application process um, link with the marketplace application. So that's part of section one of our webinar today. And then the second section is on what I'm calling non-financial eligibility. We'll discuss briefly the income limits for each of the Medicaid programs. Um, but in general, we're talking how does, um, what are the categorical eligibility components of being eligible for Medicaid in Texas? And um, that will become more obvious what I'm talking about once we get into it. Um, and please do let us know if you have any problems hearing, um, just put that on the, uh, on the chat. And if you have any technical issues, I've got my colleagues here um, assisting with the webinar as well. So that brings us to who's on the phone. So I am, um, as I mentioned earlier, Melissa McChesney. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Center for Public Policy Priorities. Um, and I've been um, in that role, uh, like I mentioned, since January 2015. But prior to that, I worked for the Texas Health and Human Service Commission on the ACA implementation team in their policy department. So I helped, um, I was on the team that helped get the Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program policies up to date so that they would comply with the Affordable Care Act. As many of you know, there are a lot of changes that came with that. Um, assisting me on the call today is my boss and advocate extraordinaire, Ann Dunkelberg. She's an associate director here at the center and has been doing Medicaid policy analysis and advocacy for consumers um, for the last 20 some odd years. So she has a lot of historical knowledge and um, experience in this arena and um, will be assisting me with answering questions. I'll be doing most of the presentation of the slides, um, but uh, since we have so many people on the call and we've got her as a resource, we will, she'll be assisting us. Um, Anne, did you want to put did you want to say anything at this point? No, I'll just say hello, good morning, and uh, like I'll be standing by to help with questions. Great. All right. Um, so without further ado, I am going to get started. Uh, please do, I, I see a few people have had some technical issues calling in. Um, we do have um, some uh, We've got my colleagues over at the center helping with those pieces, so please do uh, keep working on that until you can get logged in to the audio. You can also connect the audio using the computer, so if you plug in headphones to your computer and hit use computer, you should be able to hear it that way as well if you're struggling with the um, phone line. All right, so as I mentioned, section one of this I'm going to interrupt please. you, Melissa, just sure. a little bit. So everybody, if the, those of you who are on the phone and not hearing anything, be sure to, to look at the lower left-hand corner of your screen. There's the toll-free number that you can call in uh, to do the non-computer version of the sound. And um, <laughs> so anyway, just be sure to keep an eye on that. We're, we're putting that information up over and over again, and some people have had trouble with the phone number, and there's an alternate phone number you can call to. So that's great. Thank you, Ann. Helpful, I, but I'll be quiet now. No, no, you're great. I want to make sure everyone can hear. 
it would be a very painfully boring webinar if all you could see were my slides. All right. We just saw the chairperson put the access code up one more time for everyone, um, so please do see that. Okay. Okay, so um, we're going to start with the eligibility process. Just a quick reminder, please do feel free to put questions into the chat box and we'll flag those for the question and answer section after section one. So the one thing that came with the Affordable Care Act was this concept of no wrong door. Um, part, of the, um, part of the goal of the Affordable Care Act was to create what was called a continuum of coverage. Now, um, because Texas didn't expand Medicaid. We do have a hole in that continuum, um, but bear with me. Um, the idea was that everybody under 400% of the federal poverty level should have been eligible for something. But it's not always clear to consumers what they would be eligible for. So um, the idea was that um, no matter where you apply for coverage, whether you start with the federal health insurance marketplace um, which is what runs our marketplace in Texas at healthcare.gov is the online um, website for that. So whether you start at healthcare.gov or you start at yourtexasbenefits.com, which is the online application run by our Medicaid and CHIP agency here in Texas, the Texas Health and Human Service Commission, you should be able to um, eventually get to the right place. So this rather complicated diagram here shows how that um, process should work. So let's, let's look at what would happen if I apply with the marketplace. So they apply in the marketplace and then they put their information in. The marketplace assesses um, their eligibility for Medicaid and CHIP first. That's the first thing that the marketplace will do if you stay in that application. I would like to um, apply for help paying for my coverage. So if you are assessed as potentially eligible for um, Medicaid and CHIP, what it's going to do is transfer you over to HHSC. Um, so that's that top arrow that sort of goes across. This is called an electronic account transfer. This is not something um, that the client has to force the system to do. It does it, the system does it automatically. And then HHSC receives that application and picks it up. What often happens at this point is that HHSC may need to reach out to the client for some additional information, often it's verification of some sort, um, likely verification of income. Now, then they will determine their eligibility for Medicaid and CHIP. If they're eligible, they'll be enrolled in one of those programs. If they are determined that they are actually ineligible for those programs, then the client's information is transferred back to the marketplace, and the marketplace then reaches back out to the client and says, oh, it looks like you weren't eligible. Please come back in, pick up your application, and, um, and finish that um, application and enroll, and if you are eligible for coverage in the marketplace, there are going to be some people who won't be because they're in the Medicaid um, coverage gap, um, and we can talk about that briefly. Then, but if they are eligible, then they can finish their application and choose a health plan with subsidies. Now, let's just um, go through the whole process, but from the other direction, again, assuming no wrong door, if they apply with HHSC, um, and, and they're determined ineligible for Medicaid, they are then transferred over the marketplace and the same process happens. The marketplace reaches out to them. They are, el they are able to, um, uh, they're able to finish their application and choose a plan if they are eligible. So um, there you have the no wrong door functionality and how that works. I, I often point this out because I think there is a um, misconception that when you're going to the marketplace, you're applying for marketplace coverage. Or when you're going to yourtexasbenefits.com, you're applying for just Medicaid or CHIP. When in fact, both applications are technically from a policy perspective considered what we call the single streamline application, which means they are both applications for all insurance affordability programs, which include marketplace subsidies, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Plan. So, um, so it's important to remember that so that you can let clients know if they have applied at the marketplace that they may end up being transferred over for Medicaid and CHIP, especially the children are often that's who's identified as potentially eligible 
um, so that they know that they may then be reached they may then be, be reached by the Texas Health and Human Service Commission, our Medicaid agency. So before we move on, I wanted to make one very clear distinction here, and that is that the vast majority of this webinar, with the exception of the next slide, will be covering what we consider the MAGI group. That is, um, MAGI stands for Modified Adjusted Growth Income. With the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, the way that household size and income are, are now counted for certain Medicaid programs is using this methodology, the Modified Adjusted Growth Income Methodology. For those of you not familiar with this term, um, the easiest thing to think about is at the bottom of your 1040 on your personal tax return, there you calculate what's called an adjusted gross income for this um, for the purposes of Medicaid eligibility and eligibility for marketplace subsidies, um, modified adjusted gross income was created. So there are a few tweaks to that. We won't go into that today. That's actually going to be covered um, in detail on next week's webinar. But um, it's just important to know that for these groups, and they're listed here on the screen, Children's Medicaid, CHIP, Medicaid for Pregnant Women, um, CHIP Perinatal, and Parent and Caretaker Medicaid, um, that, those are considered what we call MAGI groups. So those are Medicaid groups where modified adjusted gross income methodologies, methodologies are used to determine their eligibility. So when I'm discussing the vast majority of what I will be covering for the rest of the day, we are focused primarily on those MAGI groups. Um, there, are, there is still Medicaid groups that you do, where you do not use um, MAGI methodologies where the eligibility process for those did not change under the Affordable Care Act in general. There were a few changes that applied to all groups, but in general they didn't change. And those are specifically disability-related Medicaid and um, aged and Medicare-related Medicaid. So those, that's often what's referred to as Medicaid for the Elderly and People with Disabilities, or MEPD. So, um, so we will discuss that briefly in the next slide, but in general, we're talking about MAGI groups when we're talking about these pieces. So um, the process for non-MAGI Medicaid in reference to the no wrong door that we discussed two slides back with the rather complicated um, chart um, is that there are certain questions on healthcare.gov that are meant to screen for potential eligibility. Um, these questions ask about the need for daily um, support or long-term services and support. So there are two questions on that application, and if either one of those are answered positively that, yes, you may need help with daily tasks, then that application is flagged as potentially eligible for um, Medicaid for the elderly or people with disabilities. However, the application at healthcare.gov, which I mentioned earlier, the single streamline application, is not the application that the state of Texas uses for those groups. Um, that application is the H1200 in general. There are a few others, but the, the primary one is the H1200. So what will happen if a person is flagged by healthcare.gov as potentially eligible based on those screening questions, they're still going to send an account transfer over to the state, like we mentioned in the No Wrong Door slide. But what the state will do looks a little different. They can't process that application because they don't have the right information. It's not the right application. So instead, they will mail the client a, um, an application so that they can apply for Medicaid for the elderly and people with disabilities. The client will then have to fill that application out instead and apply if they do um, think they may be potentially eligible for that um, type of Medicaid. And I just want to reiterate, you will get a copy of these slides, but please do um, ask questions uh, if we get to something that you'd like um, addressed in more detail during the Q&A. All right, so let's talk about the eligibility process. That's what Section 1 is all about. So we've already mentioned the application um, a little bit. So the first step is applying, and you can do that on your texasbenefits.com or healthcare.gov. Both are considered the single streamlined application. You can also use Texas Integrated Application, which is included on your texasbenefits.com. It looks all the same. It's not like you have to select one or the other. It's just based on what you choose at the beginning. Do you want to apply just for Medicaid, or do you want to apply for Medicaid, SNAP, and TANF? Um, or 
you can use the paper application, which is the Form 1010. So there are both online and paper application options to apply. The second stage is what we call documentation. So often, it, under the Affordable Care Act, states are required to use as much electronic data as they can to verify the information that is in an application before asking for that information from the client. But because of how Texas uses fairly strict verification rules, often what they have available to them electronically is not sufficient to verify income specifically. So they will often um, pend a case and reach out to the client either via phone or um, send them a request for information in the mail requesting additional documentation. Uh, it is important to point out that when you are applying for a pregnant woman or a child for Medicaid or CHIP, there are less restrictive verification policies for those programs than if you had a parent applying for Medicaid or someone applying for SNAP and TANF. So you're less likely to see a request for information from pregnant women and children. And then finally, during this documentation stage, if you're a parent or caretaker applying for Medicaid or someone, a family applying for SNAP or TANF benefits, they're, um, they will be required to attend a phone interview. Interviews are not required for pregnant women and children. Now, this middle step, the CHIP waiting period, only applies to CHIP, and it only applies to children who have been insured in the previous 90 days from when their CHIP um, starts. So basically what Texas requires is that you be uninsured um, for at least 90 days um, and that means not you don't have employer-sponsored or private coverage for at least 90 days before you can enroll into the CHIP program. Um, we'll have a couple of slides that we'll go over briefly on this issue in just a moment. So if you are a CHIP kid, you may have that 90-day waiting period. So going to the next step is enrollment. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about enrollment on these webinars, but it is an important piece of the process. So this is the point at which you pick a medical and dental plan in Texas. We do have um, managed care in our Medicaid and CHIP programs, meaning you will have to pick um, a, a health plan like Blue Cross Blue Shield. You'll have a couple different options depending on where you are in the state. Um, and they have to pick those and enroll and likely identify a primary care provider. For CHIP kids, you may also need to pay an enrollment fee depending on the income of the family. Um, and then finally, you have this, what we call a period of reasonable opportunity. Um, that is legalese. <laughs> it comes directly from the regulation. But basically, if you get all the way to the point where everything makes you look eligible, but you just haven't um, yet been able to provide documentation of, you, of what you said you are as far as, I've said I'm a citizen, but I haven't had a chance to provide you my passport or birth certificate or I said I have a valid immigration status, but I haven't had a chance to provide that information, um, the, the um, HHSC is required to go ahead and enroll you in Medicaid or CHIP and then provide you 90 days to um, provide that verification. If you're a person who's familiar with the marketplace, the marketplace also does this um, type of a process. So the, but if that, client does not provide verification within that 90-day period, their Medicaid will, um, their Medicaid or CHIP will end. All right. So we're just going to briefly go over the CHIP waiting period. There are several reference slides in here that I'm not going to take a lot of time to go through specifically, but we wanted to include them so you'd have them um, in the handouts after the webinar. So the major thing to take away from the CHIP waiting period is that most kids are exempt. Um, Texas has a lot, has historically had a lot of reasons why children would be exempt for having to wait for those 90 days. And with the Affordable Care Act, the um, CMS or the federal government identified uh, required exemptions to any waiting period that was imposed for children in the Children's Health Insurance Program. So, um, and I, I will include a list of those um, in, in a further slide. So most people are exempt, but if you're not exempt, if you do have a child who simply dropped their employer coverage and then wants to move over to CHIP and they need to wait that 90 days, um, it is a very cumbersome process for them to make sure that they don't go with a period of uninsurance. 
here's what that process looks like. Again, I don't want to go through every step, but you can see there are a lot of steps. And basically what happens is they are eligible to go to the marketplace and get coverage for that 90-day while they're waiting for their CHIP coverage to kick in. But all of the yellow boxes on the screen in front of you, that lovely mustard yellow, um, that's a place where the client actually would have to engage in the process to get this done. I am um, I'm fairly certain that most clients aren't able to jump through all of these hoops and get that um, coverage gap filled, but we did want to put it out there um, as a potentially burdensome process to keep from being uninsured for those 90 days. And then again, here are all the exemptions to the waiting period since most children are exempt. We're not going to go through them all um, for time's sake, but they will be in the slide packet for reference. All right, so now we're uh, now we'll move on to certification period. So this is sort of, okay, now we've got enroll. What is, what is the enrollment look like for the next 12 months? Um, so under the ACA, uh, for Medicaid and CHIP, uh, the federal government required that certification periods are now 12 months long. Prior to the ACA, Texas only had a 12-month certification period for CHIP claims. Um, Medicaid, children in Medicaid um, were only given six months of eligibility prior to the ACA, but that was changed to 12 months. However, when the ACA passed, the Texas legislator chose not to align the CHIP and Medicaid policy 100%. Um, this is a fairly complicated slide, so please do feel free to ask questions. But let's start sort of at the top and work our way down. So if you are a CHIP client who is at or below 100%, Excuse me, I am realizing that there is an error in these slides, and I will fix it before we send out the final version. So uh, the top one should be labeled as if you are a CHIP client above 185%. So the, top, the labels for the top two um, graphs are switched. So if you are a CHIP client above 185% of the um, federal poverty level, you still have continuous eligibility for 12 months, but you will get the six-month income check. This existed before the ACA, and it still exists now. The one difference is that previously, if the, um, if the agency didn't have any indication that your income had changed, and they, they would just simply ask you to re-verify your income in six months. Now, they can only do that if they have an indication that your income has changed when they look at electronic data. So you'll likely see less people being, um, having information requested at that six-month income check now after the ACA implementation. So now, if you are a child that's below 185% of the federal poverty level, you get 12 months of continuous solid coverage. That's what we'd like to see most, all of our clients um, have, and that's what we advocate for. But now, if you go to the very bottom, um, we have the uh, children's Medicaid. This is where, when we mentioned that they didn't, the Texas legislator did not align the policies for CHIP and Medicaid, this is what we're talking about. They have the option to go ahead and give 12 months of continuous eligibility for the children's Medicaid. But instead, they chose not to do that. And instead, right now, what you'll see is children get six months of continuous, and then they get six months of non-continuous. What non-continuous means is if you have a change in circumstance, so their income increases, then that may, or their household size changes, someone moves in or out of the house, then that can affect eligibility and they may be moved off of the program. In addition to these changes, um, the Texas Medicaid Agency at the um, direction of state leadership also implemented periodic income checks. So during the months five, six, and five, six, seven, and eight for children's Medicaid, because they're the only um, children's program that has any non-continuous segments. These children can receive an income check from the state. And what that means is that the state looks at electronic data to see if anything has changed that may make them potentially ineligible. Um, if they are, in el or if they do look potentially ineligible, then they'll have to re-verify their income in order to stay on Medicaid. Please don't forget, um, um, don't forget that we, you can ask questions in the chat box and we will make sure to address them during the question and answer section for part one. Okay, 
So now let's talk about certification periods for parent or caretaker relatives. Um, so with the Affordable Care Act, again, they also got 12 months of eligibility, but they do not have any segment of continuous eligibility at any point during their certification. If they have a change in circumstance, um, it can affect their eligibility. So again, if their income goes up or their household size changes, they could um, potentially lose eligibility for Medicaid. And so they get 12 months of continuous eligibility or non-continuous eligibility, and they get income checks monthly all the way up until the renewal begins in month nine or 10. So they also may, be requ they may also um, have requests for information if electronic um, data makes them look like they may be ineligible. Now finally, we've got certification periods for pregnant women. Pregnant women actually look the most similar from a certification period perspective um, after the ACA implementation compared to before. So just like before the ACA, they have continuous eligibility, and their um, eligibility certification period is actually not necessarily 12 months. It's from the date of from the month of application through birth plus two months of postpartum, so after the end of the pregnancy. Um, so this, this segment could be um, any length of time, depending on when they actually apply, how far along they are when they actually apply. Um, but, but then they get two months of postpartum. So then what happens after that can get a little bit sticky. Um, I'm going to go over it at a high level right now, but I do want to let everyone know on the phone that we are working on some training that specifically targets pregnant women, um, the, that population, because um, in Texas, it can get a little complicated what programs they're eligible for and where they go after the end of their pregnancy. So at the end of their two months postpartum period, depending on their income status and whether or not they are a citizen, they have a different buckets that they may go into. First, if they're very, very low income, they may end up going to the parent and caretaker relatives Medicaid, but they would have to be very low income. We don't have a large population there because our income standard is so low. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. If they're, um, if they are at a very, a much higher income, so above the poverty line, then they may be eligible, eligible for subsidies on the marketplace. As we mentioned before in the very first slide on the no wrong door, the Medicaid agency and the marketplace do talk to one another. So once a woman ends her um, postpartum period in Medicaid and her Medicaid ends, the agency, HHSC, does send an electronic account, account transfer to the marketplace, and that client may see a letter from the marketplace saying, hey, it looks like you might be eligible for coverage. Why don't you come apply? So they could be eligible for subsidies in the marketplace if they are above 100% or they could fall into the Texas Medicaid coverage gap. Now, I, I, um, a lot of these women will fall into the coverage gap. And what that means is that they're not low enough income to get parent and caretaker relatives Medicaid, but they're not high enough income to get um, subsidies in the marketplace. Or they could have no access to coverage due to the family glitch. This is likely for women above the poverty line who have, um, may have access to their um, husband's employer-sponsored plan, but it would be too expensive for them to actually purchase into that plan. So those are, that's another reason why they may go uninsured. Now, for all women now, and you'll see this in the second bullet, at the end of their postpartum period, they will be automatically enrolled into the new Healthy Texas Women's Program. This is sort of a retooling of what used to be called the Texas Women's Health Program. Um, and again, what, we can talk more about what this program provides, but it, does not, it is not minimum essential coverage. It is not health insurance. It is a program that provides certain um, women's health care services, specifically access to reproductive health care and contraception. So they will be automatically enrolled into that coverage. And while we very much support that, especially for the women in the Medicaid coverage gap, we do have concerns that women may not understand that they don't have coverage now. They just have this women's health care services program. And for those women above 138% of the federal poverty level, if they go uninsured, they may be subject to a penalty on the taxes. So it's important to um, communicate that to clients after they go off of their pregnant women's Medicaid to make sure that they're not uh, making themselves vulnerable to tax penalty. All right. 
keep those questions coming. I promise when we're done with this first section, we'll get to them. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about the renewal process very shortly. Um, because there are some new things that came after the implementation of the ACA that we'd really like to, um, to point out. So first, um, the Medicaid agency, HHSC, no longer renew, sends a full renewal packet in the mail. So what they send is a cover letter that says um, you were found eligible. I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm going to need to take two steps back. With the Affordable Care Act, the, um, the process for renewal looks a little bit different. You may hear people use the word administrative renewal or ex parte renewal. What that means is that um, the agency is required, again, to use that electronic data to see if they can go ahead and renew coverage without reaching out to the client. If they can do that, then the client is going to get this cover letter that says, you look like you're still eligible. Here's all the information we have on you. Let us know if anything changes and they're going to go ahead and renew them, and they'll get another 12-month um, certification period. Now, that we've heard only happens for about 20% of clients, so because of the strict verification policies that Texas implements. So for all of the other clients who can't be renewed using electronic data, they'll get a cover letter that says, hey, we need some information from you before we can renew your coverage. But what's often confusing to people is that they think that that is the renewal packet, because that's what they're used to seeing. But that does, is not a full renewal packet. And specifically, it doesn't have a signature line for them to submit a signature for their renewal. So what it does instruct them to do is go online and fill out the renewal. So one thing that, that clients can do is go online to yourtexasbenefits.com and complete that renewal. They also can go online to print a hard copy. If they're not comfortable walking through the whole process, you can go to the view notices screen and find a PDF of the renewal and print it there. They can print that off, sign that copy, and mail it in. Or, and this is often most comfortable for clients um, who aren't as comfortable with the online process, they can call 211 and request that a pre-populated renewal letter, letter is mailed to them. So again, this is for the, those MAGI clients, those children and pregnant women and parent and caretakers. Um, anybody in MEPD Medicaid will get the full renewal packet in the mail. So it's important that we're pointing this out because what we saw happen after they implemented this was a lot of people were submitting the required documentation, but because they didn't understand that the renewal packet wasn't a full renewal where they could sign, they were getting to the point where the agency had everything they needed except for a signature because they hadn't gotten a hard copy somehow to sign it or, or they hadn't gone online to do an electronic signature. So we're going to talk about how to do that briefly. First, you can go online and complete, log into your account, um, review and update if necessary the already populated online renewal, upload any re requested documentation, and then you can do the electronic signature online. If you want a hard copy, you can go online and go to Letters and Forms, where they can view their letters and forms. They'll find a PDF there that can be printed out, signed, and mailed um, to HHSC, or you can fax it in or provide it to the office. If they're not comfortable with going online at all, they can always call 211, option 2, and request a copy be of the full renewal form be mailed to them. They'll then get the full renewal form in the mail, and they can sign and send it back in. We point this out um, because it was something uh, I actually know Sister JT meant to be on the phone call today. She's an advocate out of San Antonio. I call this the Sister JT fix. So with, um, with this implementation, the advocates pushed really hard for an option for clients to turn off this um, functionality where they can't get everything they need in the mail. So for clients who aren't comfortable using the online system, if you can go ahead and get them logged into an account and then go and update their um, messages, their managed messages, to, and tell the system, I want everything in the mail, then they will get from that point on all of their renewal packets in the mail. Now if you have some tech savvy people who don't want to receive things in the mail, then you can also go to that same place and tell the system you want to go paperless, and that means they'll get everything online. So it really depends on how comfortable that client is with those sorts of processes. And I'm going to take one quick second to show you what that looks like 
So here in this screenshot, you'll see the letters and forms. That's where you can go get print off your forms. But in order to go paperless or to get everything in the mail, you need to go to Manage Messages, and there is um, the ability to turn that off. Um, and we'll, you'll get this, and this will have a link to a video on how to do that exactly. I will say that we expect sometime soon, although it has been delayed, for the yourtexasbenefits.com to get a facelift. And so some of these screenshots may become obsolete, but we'll make sure to make a new FAQ on the renewal issue as soon as we um, have the ability to see the new user interface and get that updated. All right, it looks like we've got we are to the question and answer section before we go into section two. And it looks like we've got several questions here. So I'm um, go ahead. ahead. This is Ann, and, and uh, I, uh, I will take the liberty of butting in and sort of doling questions out to you, Melissa. The sure. first question we had was from uh, Claudia who asked, uh, why on earth is there a 90-day waiting period for CHIP so that the kid will have no health coverage for three months? And uh, that's sort of all of our, you know, reaction who live in the real world. But the, the short answer was that it was a matter of the politics when the Texas legislature uh, passed its law to create our CHIP program in Texas. The conservative members wanted to discourage anybody who had private insurance or insurance to their job from dropping it and going on to CHIP. And so they put that policy in place, and they haven't fixed it yet. They could get rid of it, uh, and we will be encouraging them to do that, but they haven't gotten rid of it yet. So it's still there in Texas law. Uh, the next question is, what options are available when the applicable enrollment fee for CHIP cannot be paid? I assume what Mary Landa meant by that was when someone can't afford it. Uh, and there is not really a program for that per se that I'm aware of. Uh, at the state level. So Mary, if I didn't, if I misinterpreted your question, go ahead and type back in and, uh, and we will, you know, I, I will check it before we wrap up this, um, this Q&A section. But I think that, you know, somebody who has an enrollment fee and can't afford to pay it, you know, they're basically uh, at, the, at the mercy of looking to their community and their family and friends to see if there's somebody who can help them with it some charity or something like that because there's not any kind of official state program. Would you agree with that, Melissa? I would. And I will point out that our enrollment fee is, is rather low. Um, if I'm correct, I think the highest it goes is $35. Um, and it's not for everyone. It, the, the enrollment fee is less if you are a person who's um, got a lower income. It's that 185 and above that end up with that, lo that larger enrollment fee. And it's a yearly enrollment fee. It is not a monthly premium. So um, it's not as much cost up front as other states, uh, as certain other more conservative states. Um, then we had a question, which was a very good question, asking how those periodic income checks for kids uh, or for parents, uh, how do they affect families that are self-employed? And I, obviously that's kind of a big question. Um, not, you know, no, no two self-employed families are exactly alike, but I think it's safe to say that, uh, that a self-employed, uh, a family with a self-employed parent or, or caretaker is more likely to be contacted by the agency and requested to provide additional documentation uh, at those checks because they are less likely to have the data that they need to prove up their income available through the sort of electronic sources that are available to the state. So there's no way to say, make a blanket statement about exactly what's going to happen for self-employed, but I think um, my experience and Melissa's and probably those of you on the phone as well is that our self-employed folks, you know, have a tougher time documenting their income and are more likely to be asked for additional information than someone who's, you know, working at a, a salary job with a, with a predictable paycheck. Do you want to add to that, Melissa? I will, I will just a little. One, one thing that I mentioned before, with the Affordable Care Act, um, the, the agency can only reach out on those periodic income checks if they have an indication from the electronic data that something has changed. So um, while I do agree that they may end up being um, reached out to, it sort of depends on the situation. Because, because there's less electronic data on them, it is also less likely that the agency will get some indication of a change in that income using the electronic data. 
So um, it could also work to their advantage, but again, I definitely agree that in general, um, the, uh, the use of electronic data, while can, it can be useful for certain clients Great. so that they don't have to provide as much verification, but for your self-employed client, um, it, it wasn't something that was that useful, especially because we don't use IRS tax income data, which is what the marketplace, for example, can use for those self-employed individuals to verify their income, but the agency doesn't use that. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, so, no, I'm just saying, if you find yourself having encountering spectacular problems for self-employed families or things that just don't seem right, uh, that's the kind of stuff we would love to hear from you from. And don't forget Melissa's email address is on the front slide uh, of this presentation, um, which you will all get afterwards. Um, so then we had a question jumping over to maternity-related coverage that says, so those who thought they were covered for six months after the birth are not. And uh, I would probably uh, might need more information from Elizabeth who raised that question about, I don't know who the people are who thought they were covered for six months after birth, but with Medicaid maternity coverage as well as CHIP Perinate, uh, there's essentially you know the, the program, your eligibility for the program uh, terminates two months after or at the end of the second month after the birth. Um, so you know, oh, let us one know. thought I have, one thought I have, uh, Anne, is uh, that you still get deemed newborn coverage. So the, the newborns are covered for a full year after oh, birth, yeah. um, but not yeah. the mothers. If, so I don't that know if that may have been where the confusion came from. Yeah, that could be. So the newborns have 12 months of coverage. That's right. Uh, the the moms, however, lose their coverage two months afterwards. Now the one extension to that uh, for everyone, Elizabeth and everyone else, is obviously if a mom was at super low income so that she would have qualified for Medicaid even before she got pregnant, then her coverage isn't going to terminate right after the birth. But in Texas, that's a very, very small number of, of parents. As you probably most of you know, very few of our parents actually have low enough income to have Medicaid for themselves unless they're pregnant. Then we had a question from Carl that said, Healthy Texas Women is only good for three plan family planning visits, right? And I checked, I ran down the hall to our resident expert on women's health programs, uh, Stacy, and she said, uh, actually, probably what Carl is referring to is that uh, I, probably Carl works for a federally qualified health center or a community health center. The community health centers uh, are able to bill up to three visits uh, to Healthy Texas Women, uh, I, I guess per year, uh, and, uh, and th but that's a very special situation that's just for them. And for other providers that are in Healthy Texas Women, from the point of view of the client, you get one well woman checkup per year, but if your provider uh, has to see you again during that year in order to renew your contraception, then you can have additional visits for that. So the, the particular three-visit thing is probably unique to your community health centers. Um, then we have Isla Guerra asking, uh, are tax penalty, is there exposure to tax penalties for being uninsured for people between the poverty line, 100% of poverty, and um, 133 or 138% of poverty, the upper, uh, the upper limit that we would have for uh, for adults Medicaid if we've done Medicaid expansion? It's a really great question, and uh, the answer is no, that Congress, um, that there is a special uh, rule in place that says that anyone who lives in a state that uh, where they are excluded from coverage uh, or where the state hasn't done Medicaid expansion is not subject to that penalty, and you might logically think that that would only apply to people below the poverty line since the folks above the poverty line could get a subsidy. They have just made that apply to the entire income group. Now, Melissa, you're going to tell me if I got that wrong, right? No, that's correct. It goes all the way to 138% of the federal poverty level. And I would include that it doesn't even ask for your citizenship or immigration status. So even though we've expanded Medicaid, if we expanded Medicaid, it wouldn't cover your LPRs or your green card holders. Um, from a tax perspective, they didn't want to have to do that sort of check on immigration status for taxes. So it is a blanket coverage for everyone all the way up to 138% of the federal poverty level who are filing taxes in Texas. I'm, we're getting into some nice, long, complicated questions, so let's, let's roll on through them. We've got one from Clarissa 
uh, who is asking about if I want to start an application through healthcare.gov, you know, what about the open enrollment dates and closed enrollment dates for the healthcare market? And then she says, specifically for women who are not pregnant and need some type of coverage, how could they then prevent the penalty fee? Um, you, do, you do reduce your penalty. The sooner you can sign up, the better. Um, but you are correct. There, there, uh, there is an open enrollment period. There is a long list of uh, special enrollment periods, you know, life circumstances that do allow you to be an exception to the open enrollment period. And we can uh, be sure to send around a link to a good list of those at healthcare.gov. But unfortunately, it's, it's one of the like, big educational things that, that all of us need to get out to the public, um, at least the ones above 138% of poverty, is that getting pregnant is not uh, one of those um, life events that qualifies you for an exception. So if you're planning a family, you, know, you, you can get Medicaid uh, at any time, 365 days a year. But if you need private coverage because you're over that income level for Medicaid, you need to, to plan ahead and get your coverage before you get pregnant. Melissa, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, the one thing I would add, and again, we said we'd do a targeted training on that, is that I mentioned earlier that when you come off of pregnant women's Medicaid, you could be subject to the penalty if you don't then enroll in marketplace coverage. Um, but what I didn't specify is that you're going to have a special enrollment period um, because you lost Medicaid. That's one reason why you could get a special enrollment period and because you gave birth. Both of those are reasons to be able to enroll outside of open enrollment. So while that doesn't help for women who haven't recently had a child, it does help for those women who come off of pregnant women's Medicaid and that are above the poverty line and could get those subsidies. So, right. So that would be uh, for the lower income women who have access to Medicaid, there are some more options. For the women whose income is too high for Medicaid uh, maternity coverage, then they, they're the ones who we really need to be encouraging to, to plan ahead if they're planning to start a family. Okay. I think, uh, Melissa, why don't you read the Claudia Garcia question, and I'm going to jump ahead to Gracie's question. Can you see the questions okay, Melissa? I will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead and read that one, and I'll let you respond to it because uh, sure. it's right so, up your alley. Uh, sure. Think about so, it. Think about it, and then I'm going to answer Gracie's question while you're reading and thinking. So Gracie's oh, okay, question ahead. is, out of the current conversation, oh, do children in CPS, she corrected that she meant CPS, get Medicaid coverage automatically, or does it depend on the family's income they're placed with? The most kids that are in the care of the state in foster care do automatically get Medicaid. There are situations that get more complicated, but they do automatically get Medicaid if they are deemed to be in state or private foster care, and uh, it is done through a special managed care program, special version of managed care that uh, attempts to make sure they have uh, better than average access to specialty care and mental health care. The next question, uh, we probably would need more. Jessica Rodriguez asked about more detail on the six and 12 months in uh, Medicaid and CHIP. And I think, Jessica, we may need to get you to follow up with an email to Melissa uh, or set up a phone call with her to find out what you need more. Or you can try typing in a, a more specific question that asks what you need to know more about. Okay, Melissa, handing it back to you. Sure. So basically, uh, Claudia was pointing out that some of the, the renewal the language on the renewal cover letters is very confusing. And I agree, it can be very confusing. Um, so you're going to get, there are two versions of this letter. One is that they use electronic data and it looks like you're eligible. That's that 20% we mentioned. But then in that next paragraph, it's going to say, um, and we found you eligible based on all this information that's included in this packet, um, or excuse me, based on certain information. and We'd like you to go online, look at that information, make sure nothing has changed, and let us know if you do. So it's very confusing. It's like, well, am I eligible or am I not eligible? Do I need to go online or do I need not need to go online? Here's what you need to do. Um, if something has changed and that client hasn't submitted that change, they do need to go and submit that change to the agency. And if they're, and if they're in their renewal process, they can do that. They can submit that change on their renewal. So basically what the agency is changing is, are saying is, 
based on what we know about you and what the electronic data is, you're eligible. And they are eligible and they don't need to do anything. But as always, clients are required to submit changes. So if any of the information that is included in their renewal, which is, which is online, is incorrect, that client needs to go and submit those changes through their renewal. So that's, that's what that letter is trying to describe. Um, and I, I agree, and we will take it back through our channels to highlight that those renewal letters are very confusing. I will say that it has been acknowledged by the agency that the renewal cover letter and pre-populated renewal, those were things that were implemented really quickly and have a lot of room for improvement. And it is something that's on their to-do list, um, which is a very long to-do list, to improve. So we, during that improvement process, we will take that feedback back, that in, that especially that the Spanish um, letters are very confusing. But for now, just so you know, if they were found eligible, then they have been found eligible. They don't need to go online and do anything unless they had a change that they never submitted to the agency. If they were told that they need more information before they can be renewed, then they need to go online and do that renewal or call 211. Um, all right. Sorry, back to questions. Um, so we have uh, Ana Benavides has asked, if someone was just given a residency card and have just entered the United States but have not become a citizen yet and they are pregnant, how long do they have to wait to get services and does this apply to children as well? That's, uh, we're going to touch on some of that in the next section, Ana. So why don't we put that on hold and, uh, and you need to you know, listen carefully and maybe submit a revised question uh, if we don't cover what it is that, that you're needing to understand. Um, there's a couple of questions or comments from, from Cliff Clark that we want to – can you see those, Melissa? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll address uh, privately the, the issue of self-employed people and their data, um, but there is a question on model renewal letters um, and if they're available to the public. So I wouldn't call them model renewal letters, but you can see um, the renewal packet. I am unsure if you can see a sample renewal cover letter, but I will, um, I will look that up, and so uh, we can provide that information, the links to there. Basically, you go to the Texas Works Handbook and look under forms, and you can see a lot of the renewal forms. I, am not, I don't remember if the cover letter is there for public consumption, um, so you can see that language, but I will look for it. You don't remember if which is there? The cover letter, uh, the one that's more like prose, like paragraph, um, or yes, you're eligible based on electronic data or you're not. Um, I do know for sure that the pre a sample of the pre-populated renewal form is available online, I saw it this morning. Um, okay. But I will check on the cover letter. So I think we're going to have uh, to continue with the presentation, but I wanted to say that um, I think what Cliff has pointed out you know, is something that we can take forward to the state and see if we can encourage them to make sure everything is available to people who work with, with clients. Right. And, um, Oh my goodness, and uh, and so we will take that forward. Uh, and um, I think we have a couple of other detailed questions, and I'm going to save them for now and get us back on track and see if we uh, we will either answer them directly to the people who've asked them or add them to the next section or do it by email. Great, great, yeah. All right. So now we're going to talk about general eligibility or what I referred to. Um, as non-financial eligibility, a reminder that we will talk about income limits, um, and I will address the one question at that point that was asked about the federal poverty line, um, but we are not going to go into detail on how household site is calculated or how income is calculated. So if you want to know more about that, please sign up for our webinar um, that's going to happen at the same time, same place next week. Um, so do sign up for that. All right, just a reminder, we are talking about MAGI um, eligibility groups, those modified adjusted gross income ones. Um, but I wanted to sort of show you the, the full scope of Medicaid in Texas and how many people are in which bucket in general. So um, you'll see here enrollment data from May of 2016. Uh, you've got about 3 million children on any given day in children's Medicaid. 
Um, and you have about 350,000 in chip right now. In May, it was up to 370,000. It used to be that there were quite a bit more people in chip, but with the implementation of the ACA, um, there was a chunk of children that were moved from the chip pro um, program to the children's Medicaid program because all Medicaid limits were um, increased to 138% of the federal poverty line at least. Some of them are still higher. Um, so you do see a much smaller chip population now than you would have seen before the ACA. We have about 150,000 pregnant women in Medicaid on any given month um, and 150,000 parent and caretakers. We often point out the huge discrepancy between the number of children in Medicaid and the number of their parents that are actually eligible for Medicaid. When we look at the income limits, you'll see um, why, how that comes about, and it's basically that the income limit is so low for a parent and caretaker or relative. But it's an important thing to point out because if you really want to impact the overall health of these families, expanding Medicaid so these parents can also access it is an important component of that. Um, and then you have your disability-related Medicaid and your uh, Medicaid for the elderly and people with disabilities. Again, just a refresher, um, we are going to go over what we refer to as the Modified Adjusted Growth Income Groups. There are a couple of other groups that we'll touch on today that can also um, potentially find insurance that are maybe children or sort of fall into this group, but what we are not going to talk about today is disability-related Medicaid or aged and Medicare-related um, Medicaid. Okay, so moving on to the kids. So what we're going to do is the next several sets of slides just go over the very basic criteria for being eligible in any specific group. So we'll start with kids because they're, um, in, in some respects, the easiest. So this is children's Medicaid and CHIP. In order to qualify that, you must be under the age of 19, so once you turn 19, you're no longer eligible. You must be a U.S. citizen or lawfully present. Um, we do have some sites that talk about the difference between being a lawfully present um, individual or a qualified immigrant, but I'm going to talk briefly on this. Um, and do look out in the future for things from us um, that go more specifically into immigrant access to healthcare in Texas. Um, but in general, lawfully present is a broader group, of, it's a broader category of people than the traditional qualified immigrants. And it was something that was um, access to Medicaid and CHIP was expanded to this broader category of children. So mostly if you're here legally, um, and you're a child, you can have access. And there is, we did waive the five-year bar for those children as well, so you don't have to wait. Um, again, this goes back to that question that was asked in the first half. So children don't have to wait five years, and if they're here legally and they're, doc they're um, documented immigrants, then they are in general eligible for Medicaid. And of course, if they're U.S. citizens, they're eligible for Medicaid or CHIP. Um, this is the same categorization that's used in the marketplace. So if you are an assister who is familiar with that, um, the eligibility for purchasing coverage through the marketplace, um, it's the same set of people. It's the same legal definition of lawfully present. So you need to be a U.S. citizen or lawfully present. You also need to be a Texas resident. That just means you need to live in Texas. I point this out, though, because you um, often uh, – you will have to verify that you live in Texas. That may be like submitting a utility bill or something that way. Um, and you have a household income below the income standard. Um, we will go over the income standards on slide 28. So hold on for that, and you'll see the, the differences depending on your age or your income. And just one important note to point out, because, um, because it, it does sometimes come up with clients, I've heard anecdotally, you can't be eligible for Medicaid if you're eligible for CHIP. If you're, if, excuse me, you can't be eligible for CHIP if you're eligible for Medicaid. So you don't get to opt in and say, no, no, I don't want Medicaid, I want CHIP. Um, and sometimes, anecdotally, I've heard that clients are more familiar with CHIP, so they think that that's what they want. Um, but it, it is one or the other, and it's just depending on your income level. All right, eligibility for pregnant women's Medicaid. So, of course, <laughs> the operative word being pregnant. Um, so you do have to be pregnant. Um, again, you need to be a Texas resident, and you, have, you need a household income below the income standard, and be a U.S. citizen. That's in general, you need to be a U.S. citizen. There are a small number, most lawfully, um, most legal immigrants in Texas, adult legal immigrants in Texas aren't eligible for any of our Medicaid programs. 
there are certain qualified immigrants that may be eligible. Um, we do have a reference slide at the end of the at the end of the presentation that lists those more specifically. Um, but it, it's very basically, if you entered the U.S. before August 22nd of 1996, that's where the Welfare Reform Act was passed and Medicaid eligibility and eligibility for a lot of entitlement programs, federal entitlement programs, was narrowed um, to only certain qualified immigrants, whereas before, if you were here legally, you had a green card, you were generally treated like citizens. Well, after the passage of the Welfare Reform Act in 1986, it was narrowed. But if you were here before that, you sort of got grandfathered in. But if you entered after 1996, um, you either have to have, you have, well, you have to have been in the, the U.S. for five years, so you do have the five-year bar, but in Texas, and we are only one of six states that have this, you also had to work in the U.S. for 40 quarters of work history. Um, so that's 10 years of work history. Um, again, I don't want to get into the, the real weeds on this because we um, are working on more training materials on these specific issues, um, but you'll in general you have to have worked here for 10 years, lived here for at least five, worked here for 10, um, in order to qualify for Medicaid as an adult in Texas. So the vast majority of lawfully present individuals do not qualify for Medicaid. There are exceptions. There are um, federally required exceptions, specifically that if you have a humanitarian status. So you'll see a list of those, refugees, asylees, um, Cuban and Haitian interns, Amerasians. Those groups can get Medicaid for seven years after getting here, um, and they are also exempt from the five-year bar. Again, we include a reference slide at the end of the presentation with more specifics. I, I, this is going to show up, these exact bullets, in every slide that we talk about an adult group. Um, so I'm not going to go over them again for every slide, but in general, the, the sort of main takeaway is in general, legal immigrants are not eligible for Medicaid in Texas. They may be eligible for subsidies in the marketplace. Okay. Um, we had several questions about CHIP perinatal, so we do have that included here. Um, it is not full Medicaid coverage. That's an important thing to point out. It is only, through, it is only coverage of pregnancy-related services. But it is, the most, uh, it is one of the best programs for women who are pregnant who are non-citizens. Un even undocumented women can get this coverage. It goes all the way up to 207% of the federal poverty level. Um, and you don't have to, there's no waiting period for this, and there's no cost sharing or enrollment fees or co pays. Um, again, there are a lot of um, intricacies on how CHIP perinatal works when you may also be eligible for the marketplace, and we would like to hold those, those um, discussions for our uh, future trainings that are specifically targeted at the pregnant women's population um, just for time's sake. Um, but in general, if you're a non-citizen woman, you can get your pregnancy services paid for labor and delivery plus two months of postpartum through the CHIP perinatal program. All right. So then we have eligibility for parent and caretaker relatives, Medicaid. Again, that's that very small group of parents, about 150,000 um, in any given month. So first and foremost, you have to be a parent or caretaker relative of a dependent child. There's actually a lot packed into that one statement. We're going to define parent and caretaker relative in the next slide. Um, so we'll, we'll define that in a minute. But you do have to live with the child. You also have to have care and control of the child. This is especially important when you have parents who have joint custody. And so at the very... At a very high level, it is the child with whom the, um, or excuse me, the parent with whom the child spends the no most number of nights. So um, if you spend four nights with mom and three nights with dad, then mom is the one who has care and control of the child and is designated as the parent for purposes of Medicaid. If they live 50-50, both parents can't be eligible and the agency will make a decision as to which one has care and control. Um, and then finally, this is something that was, that was always actually a policy from a federal perspective that wasn't being implemented correctly until in, um, more recently in Texas, and that is that if you only have one child up in your house and that, per that child is 18 years old, in order for them to be considered a dependent child, they must be attending um, high school full-time and expected to graduate before they're, before they're 19. It has to be high school and they have to be expected to graduate before they hit 19. If they don't meet that qualification, they're no longer considered a dependent child, 
and therefore you're no longer considered a parent or a caretaker relative of a dependent child. Um, so those are all of those pieces packed into that one sentence. Now, um, you also, of course, have to be a Texas resident, meet the income standard, which we're going to go over, and be a U.S. citizen. And again, the same um, discussion around adult legal immigrants in Texas applies to your parent and caretaker relatives Medicaid as well, in that most are not eligible with the exception of um, the things listed here specifically if you have a humanitarian status and super low income. All right, so who is considered a parent caretaker relative? I have the full list here. This is straight out of the Texas Works Handbook. Um, so this is what could be defined as a parent caretaker relative, specifically the relative part. Um, so it could be, of course, mom and dad, or stepmom and stepdad, or grandparents, brothers, aunts, cousins, nephews, um, stepsisters, or first cousins once removed, which is the children of your first cousin. So, um, and it also, do, it also includes these additional components, which is um, if they were a spouse of any of these people listed above, even if they're no longer them because of death or divorce, um, and regardless of when the child was born, and you have great, great for uncles, aunts, nephews, and nieces, or great, great, great for grandparents. Okay. So as promised, here are the income limits for Texas Medicaid and CHIP. I think this is a very important slide with, for anyone working with these individuals. When you get the slides, pull this one out, print it off, have it on your desk. I definitely have it printed off on my desk. And the reason for that is because um, I don't think it was communicated very well by the Texas Medicaid agency that these income limits actually do look different after the Affordable Care Act um, than before. Now, what happened was there was a lot of smarter people than me doing fancy math that did a calculation of what do we need to increase these limits to to make sure we're not negatively impacting clients when we take away the income disregard that existed before the ACA. So this is what you ended up with. They did some population studies and sampling in Texas specifically and applied them to our limits. So the one that I often point out is pregnant women if you've been doing this for a while, you may have it in your head, the pregnant women's Medicaid goes up to 180, 185% of the federal poverty level. Well, since January 1st of 2014, that was no longer true um, because they converted the limit to more closely aligned with modified adjusted gross income so you wouldn't negatively impact clients. And then you have a five percentage point income disregard. So you'll notice that light orange that's on top of every bar, that is equals to five percentage points. Um, but you don't need to know all of the methodology behind this. The important thing to take away from this slide are the numbers at the top, um, which is you know, children under age one all the way up to 203, children one to five, 149. Those, those are important to remember because they are higher than they were before. Um, I do want to point out, you'll notice the two asterisks after parent caretaker relatives. In order to be able to put, show this visually on a slide, we do sort of create artificially this 20% of the federal poverty limit. I would caution you from actually calculating what 20% is and using that as the um, bar. It is actually that these are fixed dollar amounts. Um, those can be found in the Texas Works Handbook, um, and I believe there are a couple of places online at, um, that you can find those limits, maybe chipmedicaid.org, but I'm happy to send out a chart that shows the exact dollar amounts for a parent or a caretaker relative. That is what you should use when determining their, um, their eligibility because the 20% is something that we just create so that you can visually put it next to the, res the other federal poverty level income on it. All right, moving on. We wanted to briefly mention Medicaid for um, the medically needy. Um, this, I am not an expert on this type of Medicaid, but it is something that can be made available to individuals who have really high medical expenses, expenses, but their income is too high to qualify for Medicaid. Um, so this is not something that's used very often. It is administratively very difficult to qualify for, um, but often what will happen is there are people who are very good at, um, at working with this type of Medicaid likely they work in hospitals or some other provider setting that can help with this and it may be an option for those who really are out of options. 
So again, it's, it's just children and pregnant women in Texas. And what is, there is a specific income threshold that's created called the medically needed income limit. And if you have medical bills, that if you were to pay all of those bills, it would decrease your income down below that income standard, then the agency, once you've spent down, so paid all those medical bills until you're now below the income standard, they will then make you eligible for Medicaid and they will pay the rest of your bills for that month. It is just a month-to-month -month program. So again, I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but we wanted to make sure people are aware of it as an option um, for those individuals with really high medical bills but not low enough income. Now, I, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, a new group was actually created, and that is Medicaid for former foster care youth. Um, and this is actually technically not a MAGI program because there isn't an income limit. So you don't use the um, MAGI methodologies to come to, to determine eligibility for this program, but it is a program for which you can apply when you fill out an application on healthcare.gov or your texasbenefits.com. Um, so it is important that we point out that it's there, and there is a great training that was put together by the state in, um, in collaboration with stakeholders that target this group that I'm happy to provide to anyone who um, serves a lot of former foster care youth. So to be eligible for Medicaid for former foster care youth, um, you have to, of course, be a Texas resident. And this is actually Medicaid that will go up to and up through age 25. Um, why age 25? Well, with the Affordable Care Act, as many of you may know, um, dependent children are, were allowed to stay on the um, employer coverage of their parents all the way up until their 26th birthday. Well, in the case of children in the foster care program, they are wards of the state. So the, the sort of political logic behind this is they need an option. Um, in order to stay covered until their 26th birthday. So they created a Medicaid program for these individuals. So all the way through age 25, so up till their 26th birthday, they had to have been in the Texas foster care system on their 18th birthday. So uh, they had to age out of foster care. Um, and they had to be receiving Medicaid when they did that. There are just a small, teeny, tiny sliver of, um, uh, of kids who weren't actually receiving Medicaid when they aged out, but they, did, they needed to be on Medicaid when they aged out. Um, they, of course, have to be a U.S. citizen, or um, they can, if they're not a U.S. citizen, they can stay into the program up till their 21st birthday, but they may then be required to meet those um, qualified immigrant standards that we mentioned for all the other adult groups after they turn age 21. Um, so uh, this was something that wasn't really anticipated by many people, but it is um, what the current practice is here in Texas is once they turn age 21, they need to be, uh, they need to meet that definition of qualified immigrants, which is so very, very small, or um, be a U.S. citizen, or they could lose their Medicaid due to immigration status. Again, there's no income access test. There's no educational requirements. Um, previously, some of the programs for former foster care youth had an edu like you had to be attending a higher education program. Um, so none of that applies to this program. It's basically where you did you used to be in foster care and aged out when you and had Medicaid and do you need the immigration um, uh, status requirements. All right, that is actually so. These are reference slides. I don't want to go over everything. But this is a reference slide for when we say qualified immigrant, what that includes at a high level. And when we say lawfully present, what does that include at a high level? Um, again, uh, being a broader category of people. So we now, it is 1118. That leaves us 12 minutes to get to as many questions as we can. If we don't get to your question, please um, do know that we have a um, we have tracked them, so we can get back to you uh, via email to answer those questions for you. All right, and did you want to take over? Okay, I had to had to unmute myself <laughs> and reply to another question. Okay, let me flip over to. Have you moved um, the last two questions, Mia? If you'll do that for me, then I'll catch up with where we were. Um, 
we had a lingering question from the previous uh, previous section about um, if a caretaker, a parent or caretaker is applying and they're a uh, qualified immigrant, a lawfully present immigrant who doesn't have 40 quarters, you know, will will sponsor income if they have if they're a sponsored immigrant, will that come into the picture? And the answer is it could be yes for parents only. It's important to understand that none of that should apply to children's Medicaid or to pregnant women's Medicaid. So, uh, but it is a pretty complicated topic. So we may not delve any deeper into it until we do perhaps a special training on, uh, you know, immigrant uh, access to these public benefits. Um, we had another person ask, Myra, uh, whether you have to have proof of pregnancy to apply for either CHIP perinatal or Medicaid for pregnant women, and my understanding is the answer is yes. Um, but I want to turn to Melissa about, uh, then Myra says, I thought an application for emergency Medicaid would also have to be completed to cover the labor and delivery costs. And that is correct. There is, as a technical matter for how the hospital gets paid, um, there, you know, the, the paperwork does have to be processed for emergency Medicaid. We have had a lot of back and forth with the agency about, you know, how we can simplify that for the mom so that she's not really having to do two separate application processes. But I honestly don't recall exactly where we stand on that, so I'm going to ask Melissa if she does. And if um, not, we will reach out and get back to you all. Yes. Okay, uh, I couldn't remember if I had unmuted or muted myself. Um, so no, I I uh, I remember the conversation as well, and I do not remember at where we are in that as far as um, the need for an entire another application for the emergency Medicaid um, portion. So so we can add that as a question, and that can be something that could be included in future training that targets the pregnant women population. Yeah, it's a really great question because I know. Yeah, I think that it has sort of depended on where a woman was, whether she was getting the necessary assistance to make sure she got her paperwork done or not. And, and we had argued with the state that we would like to see something that makes that automatic, you know, that makes it a requirement for whoever's providing the prenatal care to make sure that they, you know, connect the woman with that paperwork for the hospital uh, where they're going to deliver. But I, I honestly do not know where it stands now. Um, so we look forward to feedback from you guys on the call, and we will also, you know, follow up with the state and see what they're saying. Um, I think this will be an easy one for you, Melissa. Uh, she was asking about uh, if the grandparents have conservatorship of a child, can the grandparents get Medicaid as caretakers? So yes, uh, they are care. Grandparents are always conservator caretakers, even if they don't have conservatorship. Um, one thing that I will just flag for so thinking about you, for so they could just be living with the grandparents. They don't even have to have formal conservatorship. That's correct, and they would Got be it. considered a caretaker under that definition. Please do keep this, um, Caroline. If you are going to be on next week's um, call, please do keep this in mind because I will say that if a grandparent adopts the child, they then become their legal parent. And that can have implications for how household size and income is calculated. So sort of keep that scenario in your head if you attend next week's webinar to see the impact of how adopting a child as a grandparent can impact your what income, whose income is included in the child's eligibility and, um, and how the household sizes. Because those two concepts, while very similar, are actually a little bit different. So please do keep that question in mind for next week. Then we have a couple of awesome questions about Medicaid for former foster care youth, and one is from Gracie Camarena, and she says she's not seeing on the 1010 where they ask about foster care. <laughs> Do you remember offhand, Melissa, uh, where it is or if it is on there? I, I do know it's on there, but I don't remember where. Um, but I, uh, Gracie and I speak often, so I'm writing it down as a follow-up to find it and point it out specifically to Gracie. It may be a little easier to find on the 1205, um, but, I, but it should be on both forms, so we will confirm. So I, uh, and I want to do a shout out to the St. Mary's Law School uh, folks uh, who have done a special project over the last couple of years to try to work with the state to improve their processes for former foster youth and their outreach. And so 
there are some some good folks uh, working on trying to improve that and to keep the Texas Medicaid agency, uh, you know, uh, to keep, hold their feet to the fire, as they say, to make sure that they're doing a good job on that. So uh, do feel free to feed us any feedback you have about problems with that. Uh, I want to oh, go ahead. Uh, I just want to build on that, that because okay. I should have said it. Um, there, the training that's provided, please reach out to me if you, in, if you work with former foster care I want to provide that training because yourtexasbenefits.com is not intuitive in how you should actually be answering questions for if you are assisting a former foster care youth. But there are specific things that you can do, sort of work around while they're trying to fix the system that will make it more likely that they get the right eligibility determination. And that is uh, detail, that's in detail on that other training. So I'd love to provide that to anyone. Just uh, send me an email to request it and I'll provide you that, that, um, that training. And we may also figure out a way to make it more uh, broadly available. So the next question from Raquel Luna is asking whether did Texas opt out of or decide not to uh, offer this former foster children's Medicaid to kids who move into Texas from after being in foster care in another state? And the answer is yes, the Texas legislature did that. That basically uh, the directive that your governor, lieutenant governor, and legislature gave to the Medicaid agency was um, we don't have to do this and we are uh, making choices to not do anything that we're not required to do, particularly if it has anything to do with the Affordable Care Act. And so that's the choice they've made. And a number of different children's advocacy groups in, uh, and the Texas CHIP Coalition and, you know, the center and other groups that you know, like CDF and Texans Care for Children, have all, uh, you know, uh, lobbied the state to make the decision to let those other kids in. Obviously, it's not going to be a huge number, uh, but it's still a choice that, that you know, uh, as advocates, we think was not the right choice for Texas. Um, let's see, we've got a couple more questions, and it's 10 to, uh, we've got five minutes left, roughly four minutes. Um, one from Gracie. Gracie, I think I'm going to answer that one privately. That looks uh, very specific. <laughs> and then from Evan Bowman, um, she had a, had a, Evan had a client family lose SNAP and Medicaid. Uh, the children are citizens, and the dad is a citizen, but the mother is uh, a resident, and she was asked to provide sponsor information which she couldn't provide, so everyone lost their benefits. This was from El Paso. We will follow up directly with Evan on the specifics of that, but that's exactly the kind of thing, you know, that we would love to try to be helpful with. We're not the only people in Texas who can help you with those kinds of problems, but we definitely want to hear about those sorts of things. Obviously, um, that should have only affected mom's benefits. If she's a non-citizen, everyone who's a U.S. citizen, uh, you know, should should have been able to have their benefits stay intact and move forward even if she was unable to provide sponsor information. So we will follow up directly on that. And let's see. Um, so uh, I've just been added, uh, handed some notes, which probably Melissa could have ad-libbed out of her brain, but I'm going to do them anyway, and then I'll let Melissa jump back in and say whatever else. Uh, I hope that a bunch of you will come back next week for part two. We will be sending around these slides as corrected and the recording after the webinar. Um, those of you, if we didn't get to your question directly, uh, will follow up by email. Thanks for your patience with our technical issues, and we will be trying to find out if there's something we can do to prevent those from coming up on our next webinar. So uh, we will try to do better next time and also uh, try to get our webinar provider to do better. Melissa, do you want to jump in there and say some parting remarks? Oh, no, I just really appreciate everyone's uh, patience today. I'm glad that we were able to get it through, mostly on time, and we'd love to see you back next week. Um, and uh, as, as Ann mentioned, my email is on there, so if you are having issues or you have more questions or you'd like just some general um, maybe training or FAQ type information on a certain population, please do let us know. There is a survey after the webinar. Um, and we will be looking to that survey to, to see any additional training needs or questions you may have. So please do feel free to include it there um, as a way to sort of mark that down as something you'd like follow up with. So uh, again, we just appreciate everything. And Anne, I appreciate um, your vast knowledge and your help on the webinar.
pleasure was all mine. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone.